A5 is sort of this conglomerate of autism, Asperger's, ADHD, atypical. Okay, that's four A's, and the fifth A is adult. The, these are a group of people who um, typically look like everybody else and look like they should pass and are usually identified as people who are lazy, difficult, um, have personality disorders, or are just uncooperative or stubborn. And when in fact usually they have a lot of subtle symptoms, um, which they're overcoming on a daily basis and they're having problems um, keeping all of the balls in the air, as we say. Asperger viewed autism as a diverse continuum that spans an astonishing range of giftedness and disability. I see that it's, it's a struggle because they have a lot to give. They have a ton to give, but they don't know how to fit it in in this world. You see, the autistic mind tends to be a specialist mind. Good at one thing, bad at something else. Uh, as a society, we're a group of people that are pretty judgmental about people who just feel odd. The thing is, you can make a mind to be more of a thinking and cognitive mind, or a mind can be wired to be more social. And what some of the research now has shown on autism is there may be extra wiring back here in the really brilliant mind, and we lose a few social circuits here. It's because they lack neurological skills that are difficult to teach. And some social mentoring in employment and at school and in the communities would go a long ways in helping these A5 at-risk individuals be more included. Uh, the highest risk, obviously, is uh, suicide. Um, people who become so despondent or who, be, who become so isolated that they have difficulty reaching out to other people. And I think what we are missing is discourse and dialogue. We don't allow for people to make mistakes. People are getting used to being pretty aggressive toward each other verbally. And I wish that there was more general uh, allowance for curiosity. If somebody did something in an unexpected way, to, instead of being judgmental about that, say, wow, why did you do that? What was your thoughts about that? And is there a way that we can pull the person back into the team as opposed to getting upset at them and ostracizing them from the team? So I would definitely say that um, my nephew is brilliant. Um, he brings a lot of joy to my life. And um, yes, yeah, sorry. And has a hard time to, you know, be in this world. Um, yeah, um, when my sister, uh, we'll just do this, right? Um, when my sister was dying, he was the one that would tell me, we're just here to love her. It was brilliant. A lot of people would not have come to that conclusion. We're so used to just following the norms of our society. He saw it differently. He was able to see, also because he hadn't had a lot of success in his life, he was able to just get it down to the bare nitty gritty. All we need to do is love her. And that made all the difference in my life, then and now. And yet, he's not working. And it's, it's frustrating. He's had a job and then that um, didn't work out after a few months. I think he has a lot to give, you know, and as a society, we haven't found how to make um, different situations work for different types of people. The types of thinking, photorealistic visual thinkers like me, pattern thinkers, music and math minds. Some of these oftentimes have problems with reading. You also will see these kind of problems with um, kids that are um, dyslexic. You'll see these different kinds of minds. And then there's a verbal mind. They know every fact about everything. The um, A5 population, the ADHD, Asperger's, autistic population, will look like the millennials, but they'll be struggling. They may be more exhausted, they may need more time by themselves, they'll be less social, they'll be, um, miss more days at work. 
Um, they'll have more difficulty getting to the grocery store in a timely fashion to make sure there's food in the house because they've used up the stuff they always eat. And they will have difficulty getting their laundry done in ways that millennials won't. This situation of having adult dependents is unbelievably hard to understand for people who aren't going through it. Shame is an epidemic in our culture. And to get out from underneath it to find our way back to each other. We have to understand how it affects us and how it affects the way we're parenting, the way we're working, the way we're looking at each other. Gold and diamond, jewels the raw and wrinkled rough cut. It will be three years in Portland come April 1st. We are here to create a new family home with a clear ambition of getting my 25-year-old daughter independent. I did okay when they were growing up as I had no idea that other families' lives were not as crazy and confused as the one I was experiencing. My kids were practically terrorized by the normal school system. Neither of them fit in, so I personally added to their trauma by continually switching schools and searching for an environment that fit them both. The divorce in 2001 over parenting and livelihood was quite painful. I was not prepared for the following 10 years of parenting hell. Last year, in response, I even tried to start a parent vows movement, hoping to underscore the seriousness of deciding to become a parent. Ann and Dale lived with, with their dad, and, and I didn't know what else to do. It's like, okay, well, the parenting part is over. I think I failed. Son was in college. Anne was like done with school. She hated school by then. So the two of them, her, her and her, her dad both, went into kind of a decline, a bit of depression. And then maybe a year and a half later, I, was, I found myself in Ashland, Oregon. Anne and Dale were quite worried about their dad. And he went on a bike ride, on a, a week-long Ride the Rockies bike ride, ended up dying. Guy, he's in his 50s, early 50s. Uh, he had sleep apnea, is what it said on his death certificate. So I went and got them, and, and, and now we're on a quest. And so that quest went from Ashland, Oregon. Dale went back to Colorado and finished up his degree. Anne and I came up here to, to Portland, and, and it's been the hardest over two years that I've spent. We're super grateful to be here. We went to vocational rehabilitation. And so now she's taking the bus and riding her bike and going and working a half day a week at Baskin and Robbins. So this is my tanky boy. Hi, baby. And my mom. I've never really understood that definition because I've never looked at myself like I was broken. There are certain things that I understand that are bad that I do have and yes there are certain things I will say that are wrong with me and one of them is clinical depression. But I learned that taking medication does help with that. It doesn't make it go away. It's never going to make it go away. Being atypical can be difficult in this world because a lot of people believe that you should be able to sit still in a classroom. You should be able to read everything on the board. You should be able to keep up with a teacher who's talking at lightning speed. You should be able to not get distracted. That's 
problematic because there are people like me and sometimes her who can't not get distracted. Asperger's ideas about teaching children with learning differences were progressive even by contemporary standards. Mornings at his clinic began with exercise classes set to music, and the children put on plays on Sunday afternoons. Instead of blaming parents for causing autism, Asperger framed it as a lifelong polygenetic disability that requires compassionate forms of support and accommodations over the course of one's whole life. Requires compassionate forms of support and accommodations over the course of one's whole life. One's whole life. Dude, you're such a dork. Um, by the way, you're being recorded. <laughs> this is what I was raised by. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm one of those parents who thought Anne could grow out of it and just needed to try harder. I thought good parenting was kind of pushing at her harder and harder. My big plan to get services here in Portland forced me to, number one, focus on a diagnosis, choosing between mental illness or developmental disabilities. Number two, advocate for her limitations. And number three, realize on this path, employment success will probably be at or below the poverty line. Yikes. Before I studied Asperger's and autism and all this, I was studying trauma and learning about this adverse childhood experiences. And it's quite fascinating because there's such an overlap between adverse childhood experiences and kind of the behavioral things that come out of that, and then what we're seeing with ADHD and other kinds of, of uh, behavior and mental health problems. So, so I think there's something bigger to this story. But there's one thing I do know for sure. I don't understand that 20% of the population can all need special supports. And here's what you need to know. Shame is highly, highly correlated with addiction, depression, violence, aggression, bullying, suicide, eating disorders. Shame is a focus on self, guilt is a focus on behavior. Shame is I am bad, guilt is I did something bad. Well, it is time to change the definition of those five A's, step away from the diagnosis, and create an invitation for a future focused on solutions. 7.5 billion solutions for that matter, one from each one of us. I would probably work on housing and employment. And let's talk about jobs. Okay, my science teacher got me studying because I was a goofball that didn't want to study. But you know what? I was getting work experience. I'm seeing too many of these smart kids that haven't learned basic things like how to be on time. I was taught that when I was eight years old. You know, how to have table manners at Granny's at Sunday party. Because the thing about being autistic is I had to learn social skills like being in a play. 
The best type of support is customized to the individual needs. And if you bring them in for internships in your companies, the thing about the autism Asperger -y kind of mind, you got to give them a specific task. Uh, so I'm Dan Bartholomew. I'm the CEO of Free Geek, which is a nonprofit in the southeast of Portland. We do um, technology refurbishment and recycling. Uh, so last year we did about 6,000 hours of education. We did about 45,000 devices out into the community, and we processed about 1.3 million pounds of e-waste. But you know, what's important about Free Geek is not the technology. What's important about Free Geek is the way we change lives. So we really get people from five to 105. And we get people across all walks of life. And we get a lot of people that are on the spectrum. We get a lot of people that are challenged in their, in their population. Um, a lot of people that are recreating their lives. Um, so folks that are trying to rebuild skills, that are really trying to rebuild and create a new career for themselves. There was a woman that caught me in the hallway and she said, well, my son is not welcome where he goes. He has, he's on, on the spectrum um, and he isn't welcome anywhere. He gets bullied when he goes to school. He gets bullied when he goes out. He doesn't really have a lot of friends, um, but here he's accepted. Here they just love him and he feels welcome and he loves coming here. He comes here every day. All summer long, he was here every day in his Star Trek uniform. Okay, Stephanie Smith, Christine Brodingham. We are here to talk about a project that we're starting. It's, um, well, what are we calling it? This is mom. She is currently wiping poo off her shoes. But most of all, love is infinite color. Everyone wants to love and be loved. Love awakens us to love. I am one of love's colors. So we don't know what's going to happen. The emerging future. <laughs>